Hello, everyone. My name is David Davis, and I am the outgoing uh, president of the Emory uh, College of Arts and Sciences Senate. And one of the events we end our year with is the annual Distinguished Faculty Lecture. And this year, I am pleased to introduce Monica Raj, who will be giving this year's lecture. Uh, Monica is an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry, having joined Emory from Auburn University in 2020. Her PhD is from the Indian Institute of Technology, and she's done postdocs at esteemed institutions like NYU and the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Raj's research utilizes organic chemistry tools to solve problems in the field of biology. Her lab uh, is geared towards the development of new chemical reactions, catalysts, uh, and litigation methodologies for the synthesis of chemical probes for studying biological molecules. Um, she has been widely and globally recognized for her outstanding research contributions. Uh, recent awards include a Kavi Fellow from the National Academy of Sciences, an NSF Career Award, uh, the NIH Mira Award, uh, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Research Fellow, and an APS Early Career Lectureship. Uh, this is just a small number of her awards. Her record is incredibly impressive. So today she's going to talk to us about chemical tools for biological discovery. So please welcome, please join me in welcoming Dr. Raj. Thank you so much, David, uh, for an uh, for awesome introduction. And first of all, I would like to thank all of you who are here, uh, as well as Peter for nominating me, faculty senate, as well as committee members to give me this honor. I'm really honored to uh, present um, this Emory College of Arts and Science Distinguished Award um, lecture for 2023. Um, so before I actually dive into research, I just, I, I'm not sure how many of you know, but I'm pretty new to Emory University. I joined Emory in August 2020, which is right at the time of pandemic. And, uh, uh, but what I've seen in last three years that um, Emory University has this very strong sense of belonging as well as, um, uh, you know, very collaborative and supportive environment. Um, so. I know that some of you have been in uh, Emory University for a long period of time, so I think I really want to thank all of you and for creating such kind of environment. Um, and actually, congratulations for, for having that environment for everyone who is coming in um, and being a part of Emory University. So I'm really uh, happy to come here, and I'm going to talk about a, a kind of research we are doing today. Um, so before I talk about my research, of course, I would like to uh, start with some acknowledgments, and one of them is is um, um, so I really want to start with acknowledging my students. My group is comprised of postdocs, graduate students, and undergraduate students. And I just want to mention that these three I have highlighted in red because they recently graduated from my lab and they have moved on uh, to industrial positions and postdoc positions. Um, and these blue ones are the undergraduate students in my lab. And that's actually very important because undergraduate students are equally invested in research as the graduate students in my lab. Um, and uh, uh, also, I want to thank um, these uh, funding sources uh, which have been supporting our research um, and both the federal uh, resources as well as the private foundations, which you can see on the slides right now. We are trying to figure out how to fix these slides. Um, but uh, yes, we are uh, funded by federal and the private foundations. Um, and I'm gonna, I want to thank all of them for supporting our research. And there is one more entity which I really want to support, which I wanted to bring by using my clicker, but it's already out there, which is Emory um, uh, Office of Technology Transfer. They have been really, really um, invested in, uh, in filing a lot of the patents uh, which have come uh, from the work in my lab, and you will see that kind of technologies we are trying to develop. So I'm really thankful for them to put that much effort. Um, with that, I think, are we ready? Should we move ahead? I think you can. 
Okay, cool. Um, so, so the major theme of my research, if you look at all the projects, and I'm going to explain all of those projects one by one, but the major theme of my research is to develop chemical technologies for translational research. And we are currently working into th four different uh, areas and four different technologies we are developing. And one of them is a technology platform for developing new therapeutics. The another one is a technology platform for diagnostic tools. Um, the third is we are developing a protein restoration technology to control the functions or the bad functions of the proteins. And finally, we are also working towards developing methods for protein sequencing technology. So I'm going to give you a brief information about all of these technologies and then I will dive into one particular project in more details. So I'll start with the first one, which is uh, uh, which is a technology platform for generating new therapeutics. So when we talk about that, what we have done in this area, we have actually generated libraries, which is like millions of libraries of these cyclic compounds in one while in a very short span of time. And now once we have these millions of compounds, we can actually use these millions of compounds, find out the inhibitors for various biological molecules, such as proteins, DNA, and RNA. RNA, and once we get these binders, we can use them as a lead compounds to develop a useful therapeutics for these kind of biomolecules which are responsible for diseases. And of course, my research is not only translational, it also have a basic component to it, that what is a basic science and then how we are using that basic science to convert them into a translational impact. So what we have done in this particular project is we started with the libraries of millions of peptides and then we have developed this method by which we can purify all of these library of compounds in one pot in a very short span of time in couple of hours and then we have used our proprietary technology which we call as cyclic and this cyclic technology convert these linear compounds to these cyclic compounds and what is so unique about this technology is that it is always considered that if you have something which is linear and you try to make a cycle they can also linearize and form dimers and polymers and that's why this technology is unique because it breaks that 200 year old belief that chemistry of cyclization is also chemistry of polymerization because by this method we can only cyclize peptides without any kind of linearization or polymerization. And with this technology, now the idea is that we have generated these millions of linear compounds and we get the corresponding millions of cyclic compounds without any cross-linking. And then what we did is again we used our beads and we can purify these millions of compounds in one pot. Once we have these pure cyclic compounds, then we can sequence or we can, we can screen them against various biological targets. And with this one, this is a particular example of a protein which is responsible for a disease. So we screened our library of compounds against this protein and what we found are there are some compounds which bind to that protein and once we find those binders, now the question arises that how do we know out of these millions of compounds which compound actually bound to the protein. And for that we developed another technology which is we call as a D-click. And what does D-click does? The click is forming the macrocycle and D-click is opening a macrocycle. And now we have opened the macrocycle and once we open it, we can actually sequence it by using LCMSMS analysis. So by using this method, now we can generate these libraries of compounds. And now the question arises that, is this the first technology ever made? And the answer is no. Of course, there are a lot of other technologies which can generate libraries of cyclic compounds. But then what is the advantage of this technology? technology over all other methods out there. I'm not sure how many of you have heard about mRNA display or DNA display or phage display technologies, but those technologies are used for making millions of these cyclic compounds. But my technology is different in though, and they have several advantages. And the, um, one is that we do not need any kind of decoding tags, and therefore we get very false hits, uh, because we get less false hits as compared to what's obtained from the current technology, because these tags are huge and they also involve in Binding, they also influence the structure. Also, but another unique feature about our technology is that it's completely synthetic in nature. And therefore, we can introduce any unnatural amino acid residues, different peptide backbone chains, and we can diversify our libraries to any extent, which is not possible with current methods of, uh, for making libraries of cyclic peptides. And uh, another important feature is this cellular permeability. So most of the technologies which are known in um, 
uh, and used, known and used by pharmaceutical companies, they synthesize cyclic peptides, but they are targeting only those molecules which are outside the cell because they can't permeate the cell. Whereas my technology has a potential to make these cyclic compounds which can actually cross the cellular membrane and then uh, impact or modify proteins which are present inside the cell. And that is very unique which is not present in any other technology out there. So just to give an example how we use this technology platform for discovering new drugs or new therapeutics for various diseases and one of the examples which I want to focus on is uh, in collaboration with Dr. Hayan Few at the Emory uh, School of Medicine. So what we did here is we all know that lung cancer is, um, um, uh, is a very difficult target. It's very, there are very few drugs which are known to treat lung cancer. But there is one such lung cancer which happens because of this mutation. So these are the genes LKB1 and STK11. These genes uh, are tumor suppressors. But if they undergo mutation, they lead to a tumor causer. And now when they become tumor causer, there is no way you can stop these genes from, uh, from, uh, from the growth of the lung cancer cells. So what we did is we took this as a target, use our technology platform and find out the binders for this particular target. And what we found that our cyclic peptide not only bind to this particular target in a selective manner, but also crosses the cellular membrane and also uh, generates an immune response which eventually leads to the uh, death of the lung cancer cells. And that is the only uh, peptide or I would say a molecule which is known so far which can actually um, do uh, control the um, growth of cancer cells which is associated with these genes. And I'm not showing you the structure of that compound because we are currently filing a patent on that particular compound before I can disclose it. Um, so uh, besides that, of course, through this technology, we are making more anti-cancer compounds for other kind of uh, cancers. Uh, and we are doing this work in collaboration with uh, Dr. Hayan Fu. And we are also developing antivirals using the same technology platform. And we are collaborating with Dr. Stefan Serafinos at the Embry School of Medicine. And in this particular example, I have shown um, the HIV, but we are also now focusing on SARS-CoV-2. As you all know that SARS-CoV-2 is undergoing mutation pretty quickly. So by using our technology platform, we can actually generate more binders and more inhibitors for those mutated SARS-CoV-2 in a much rapid manner. So this is all about our technology one. And now I'm going to switch to technology two, which is about the diagnostic tools. So in this technology, what we are trying to do is we are trying to develop a series of sensors which can detect biological metabolites inside our body. And those biological metabolites, which if they are present in high higher concentrations, they could lead to a variety of different diseases. And by using this method, we can quantify them. And the goal is that by using these methods, we can stop the diseases rather than curing the diseases. And I'll give you one simple example. Um, so we know that sugar is present in our body and it, it is generated by our lot of metabolic pathways. Uh, when we eat something, when we drink something, it undergoes metabolism and our body creates sugar. And the sugars are important, right? Because they control biological functions, they give us energy and that's very important for us. But we also know that if their concentration is higher, that is bad for us. And we know one of the diseases which occur because of the higher concentration of sugar molecules is diabetes. So now if we go the other way around, which means that if we want to diagnose diabetes, one of the way to diagnose diabetes is look at the sugar levels. If it is a normal level, it is good and we need that sugar. But if it goes above that level, it means we are in the danger zone and we should change our habits, eating habits or lifestyle to control the sugar level. And obviously, and there are actually several um, strips which are available commercially, which you can buy, use a urine sample or saliva to identify the level of sugars. Now that's just one particular example. But imagine there are so many such biological metabolites in our body, which are required, which are produced by our body. But again, if they are present in higher concentrations, they lead to a variety of different diseases. And we do not have sensors for that. And that what this technology is about, that can we develop chemical 
chemical sensors for those biological metabolites if they are present in excess in our body they lead to diseases which we do not have cure for. So for example if we talk about variety of different cancers, neurological disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's that happens because of the over concentration of those biological metabolites and that's what we are trying to target that can we develop a series of sensors to detect the levels of those biological metabolites. And with those sensors, the idea is then, then we use those chemical sensors, put it in a micro, uh, microfluidic platform and then make them in the form of a variable chemical sensors so that we can continuously monitor the concentration of those molecules and with those we can change our lifestyle, occupation or the eating habits to control the levels of those molecules or toxic molecules. And by this we can also generate lot of data and with that data we can also figure out what is the right level of those molecules because some of those biological metabolites we have the information about we know that above this concentration is bad but for some other biological metabolites we have no idea which concentration is bad but by generating this data uh, we can get information about the levels which is a bad level and which is a good level and that's the goal of this particular project. And I want to give you one particular example of a metabolite which we have developed a chemical sensor for and that is aldehydes. Now what are these aldehydes? So when we drink ethanol our body produces lot of aldehydes. When we use perfumes we inhale lot of aldehydes. When we use any kind of cosmetics we inhale lot of aldehydes and especially nowadays whenever we wash our hands with sanitizer we inhale lot of aldehydes. So what those aldehydes do normally in normal metabolic pathway these aldehydes can be converted into a non-toxic form by this particular enzyme ALDH2. But if there is a mutation in this particular enzyme ALDH2 then these aldehydes cannot be converted into this non-toxic form and they will just dissipate and go to the other parts of the body because they have very low volatility so they will just go and move to the other parts of the body. And these molecules are super reactive so what they do is they go bind to the DNA and damage the DNA. And once they damage DNA it leads to variety of these diseases, solid tumors, leukemia, bone marrow failure as well as different developmental abnormalities. Now um, uh, you must be thinking that how many people have this mutation of ALDH2 and actually it's significantly higher number more than 600 million people have this gene mutated this, this enzyme mutated and therefore all those people are at the high risk of getting these variety of different cancers, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes and Fanconi anemia and the idea is that can we develop a sensor by which we can determine the concentration of these because again they are metabolically produced in our body and which is okay and they perform good functions but the higher level is the one which is bad. So what we did is now here co uh, comes a component of basic science that we want to develop a method which reacts with only these particular molecules in the entire molecules present inside the cell. So we have to think about organic reaction which works only on one molecule not on any other molecule and after that reaction the nature of that molecule should change so it is off and as soon as it reacts it turns on mean, means that it turn on the fluorescence and from that we can identify identify the concentration. So that involves a lot of basic science research that what kind of molecules we can develop. So what we did is we actually developed one such molecule and I just want to show you a quick data of what we got and how these molecules behave. So this is cells and these are disease cells and these are labeled with a dye and that's why you can see them in this pink color. Now what happens as soon as we add our sensor into these cells you will see that those sensors react with these aldehydes and also the another thing we keep in mind that those sensors should react with these biological metabolites very quickly so that you can get a quick detection of the levels. And this is what you will see here. Now as soon as I have added the sensor uh, it reacts with aldehydes and now all these green color you see is because of the reaction of aldehydes with these sensors. And it not only tells us the concentration it also tells us where that aldehyde is abundant and where it is going. And in fact you can see here I will just want to show you this particular slide where you will see that if I slow it down you will see that how quickly it actually reacts and then uh, form um, these uh, sense and, and glow these molecules. 
So these are the kind of sensors we are working on and once we have these sensors, we have these sensors ready and the next plan is to use these sensors and put it in the microfluidic devices so that we can use them as a variable sensors to identify the concentration of these aldehydes. So this is the um, uh, second technology uh, which, which I have just explained. Now I am going to uh, uh, tell you a brief information about the third technology which we call as a protein restoration technology. So we all know that we have a millions and billions of proteins in our body. They control important functions and they are actually regulate important functions, but they are also implicated in variety of diseases. Actually if you name any disease that involves some sort of protein-protein interactions. For example, viral infections, bacterial infections, diabetes, different kind of cancers, uh, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, you name any disease that has some proteins associated or not interacting with another protein in a proper manner. So what do these proteins do? They are normally normal and they, they behave as a suppressors, but if there is a mutation in the protein or if it is not folding properly, then it leads to these abnormal proteins and these and lead to abnormal functions and that leads to diseases. So one of the a common way to inhibit these proteins or to control these abnormal function of the protein is to generate the inhibitor. And that's what a drug discovery program does that you make an inhibitor for these kind of abnormal functions of the protein and you can stop the function of the abnormal functions and then uh, everything will be okay. On the other side, if this inhibition is not working, then we have another technology which have been recently discovered which is called as a protein degradation technology. Now in this case, what happens is the proteins which are behaving abnormally, just cleave them from the body so that it will be flushed out of the body. And in this case, and this is also a very selective method and this is particularly used for proteins which if they are present in excess, that leads to disease. So you add the molecule, flush out the extra protein which is causing a problem and then control the diseases. But again, um, there are so many proteins and these two technologies are not enough to control all the bad functions of the proteins and that's the reason we are, um, we are not able to solve the problem of cancer or any other diseases. So what we thought that we need more technologies to solve such problems and we wanted to use a natural function of the protein and that's why we call it as a protein restoration technology. So here I have mentioned that these proteins act as a tumor suppressors. They are, they are are 80 million proteins in our body which act as a tumor suppressors. And how do they act as a tumor suppressor? Because this is a protein, it binds to another protein and stop this protein to behave abnormally. And in this way it suppresses us and that's the reason not everyone is carrying cancer. But if there is a mutation in this protein, this protein changes shape and now it's no longer bind to this protein, this protein goes away and perform all the bad functions and spread the cancer. So the goal is that this protein, we just have to restore this binding. If we can restore this binding, then we can have a natural function of the protein which is a tumor suppressor. And that's exactly what we are trying to do, trying to develop molecules which are not solving a problem of mutation because we cannot, but can we modify those mutations in a way that the protein automatically have all those interactions which it initially have so that it binds to its binding partner. And that technology we call as a protein restoration technology where we put these kind of biomolecule, biomolecule systems and these molecular systems just modify that mutation in a way that it restores its original interaction so that it binds to its binding partner and solves a function and behave as a tumor suppressor. And that's what technology technology is protein restoration technology. So with that I'm going to focus on the last technology which we are currently working on which is protein sequencing technology and I'll be spending most of my time today explaining this technology. And the reason I chose this technology because I was thinking about that out of all these four technologies which technology I should spend maximum time on. And I picked this technology because you will see that this technology would have impact on all the colleges which are present in Emory University. And therefore I thought that this is a good platform to explain this technology. Um, and that's what is protein sequencing technology. So, what this technology does. So we, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about next generation genome sequencing, but what this next generation genome sequencing does, it basically just sequence your entire genome and from that you can identify disease states, you can identify uh, various ways to treat various kind of diseases and now that is done uh, at a very massive scale, clinicians can use it. 
But if you think about proteins, proteins are the functional unit of the genome. So, but we do not have any such technology for protein sequencing because there are a lot of diseases which happen at the protein level, but you cannot identify them by genome sequencing because genes undergo a variety of different modifications, transcription, translation, and therefore diseases which happen at the protein level cannot be identified by genome level. So, we need a technology to un understand the function of that protein. And what we are doing in that is so the goal of this is develop a technology to understand the function of this uh, hidden protein. It is of course challenging um, because proteins are extremely complex systems. They contain millions of proteins and these millions of proteins are made up of these 20 amino acid residues. And these 20 amino acid residues further undergo variety of different modifications and which are called as post translational modifications and together they control functions but they are also implicated in variety of diseases as I have mentioned earlier that proteins are also implicated in variety of diseases but still only less than 10% of the proteome has ever been fully explored. It means there are this 90% of the protein and we do not know what they do, we do not know how they look, we do not know where the active sites, we have no idea about those proteins and all the efforts are on these 10% of the proteome. So, and the reason is, and that is the reason there is a huge gap between we do not know uh, the biological functions of life, molecular basis of life because we have no idea about how to look at these 90 percent of the protein. And the reason is of course we do not have a technology for protein sequencing and that is exactly what is the goal of this technology is to develop an innovative chemical platform by which we can modify these amino acids and post translational modifications, use these uh, tools nanopores and uh, fluoro sequencing and then develop this revolutionary technology of protein sequencing which will actually transform various fields which includes public health, life sciences, biology and medicine because it will advance our knowledge of functions of life, it might molecular diagnostics, we can identify different diseases stage as well as it would lead to discovery of new protein biomarkers. And once we know what is the function of protein, where how it looks like, we can actually discover new treatment for those diseases. Now this is the goal and this is what we want to achieve, but there is one such technology in the past which have made such a revolutionary impact which I mentioned earlier is the genome sequencing. And the reason that genome sequencing sequencing was able to make this transformative impact on the field of biomedicine because by genome sequencing we can do massive parallel sequencing in a very short span of time. And actually when uh, the first gene was sequenced by Sanger in 1975 and after that there is a continuous advancement in the field of gene sequencing and the advancement is that how many base pairs we can sequence per day. For example, here we can sequence only few base pairs per day going and we are in 2000s we were able to sequence 10,000s of base pairs per day. But to achieve that uh, massive parallel sequencing major um, transformation happened in 5 years where now we can sequence millions of base pairs per day which is exactly what is required for understanding the role of these genome and how they are involved in different disease states. But on the other side if we look at the proteome it is significantly lagged behind although the same scientist Sanger discovered sequence the protein in the first protein in 1955 which is actually 20 years before first genome was sequenced. And after that of course, there is an advancement in protein sequencing technology, but if you look at the curve, we are significantly far behind. We cannot use any of these methods to reach to the level of which we have reached by genome sequencing. And that is exactly what is the goal of my this technology that can we achieve the goal of this uh, sequ uh, protein sequencing uh, at a very rapid rate um, and uh, in a high throughput manner um, as we do the genome sequencing. And imagine if we can actually um, uh, sequence a proteome of a cell as we can currently do genomics and transcriptomics, we can actually generate this explosion of the data which will eventually give us information about the cellular functions, how they are regulated as well as it will advance our notion of molecular diagnostics beyond antibodies which will be actually a clinical boon to a medicine and that can be achieved by developing this technology. So um, the question arises that how can we solve this problem and the answer lies in these five years. So we actually looked into uh, these five years and figured out what happened in those five years that there is almost this sudden increase um, in, uh, in, the, in the way we can sequence genome. 
And what we found is actually new chemical methods were generated during those five years. And what those chemical methods do, they actually label these nucleotides, four nucleotides which forms a genome by different, um, different fluorophores or different kind of groups. And by using this method now, we can increase the molecular differences among the nucleotides and we can easily sequence them. And by this method, this revolutionary technology of genome sequencing was developed. And by using this method, in fact, now uh, we not only we can diagnose different diseases, we could understand human evolution, uh, we can develop precision medicine as well as we were able to genome the entire SARS-CoV-2 and because of that we were able to find new cures uh, for this uh, recent pandemic just because we were able to sequence the entire genome. So, the question arises that, okay, if the chemical methods can solve this problem for the genome sequencing, why we were not able to solve the problem of protein sequencing? And the question, and the answer is because protein is way more complicated than genome. And as you can see here, there are four nucleotides which form the entire genome, whereas there are 20 amino acid residues which forms the proteins. And not only 20 amino acid residues, these 20 amino acid residues further undergo modification. It makes it so complicated to analyze the proteome. And the major diff problem is that all these amino acid residues, all these modifications, there is a very small differences between them. And because of the small differences, if you try to use any kind of machine, they cannot distinguish which one is which because they are so close in structure to each other. So one other way to distinguish is that why not just label every amino acid residue with some different tag so that the molecular differences between them increases. And if that increases, we can use any known machines and figure out the sequence. And that's what was done by some scientists and what they did is they focused on these three amino acid residues which is only 13 percent of the entire proteome. They were able to distinguish these amino acid residues but what happens to the rest of the proteome. So that leads to low accuracy because we are not looking at the entire proteome. And that's exactly what we are trying to solve, develop a method or chemical platform where we can label all these amino acid residues with different groups, different post translation modifications with different groups groups so that we can increase their differences and once we increase their differences then we already have the tools available. We have the instruments such as we have these nanopores or a fluoro sequencers and it's actually look like this. This is actually a pocket uh, instruments which you can carry in your pocket, put the sample and it gives the information about the genome but we can't use them for, trans uh, for these uh, protein sequencing because of uh, the smaller differences between amino acids and PTMs. But if we use our chemical tools along with that, increase the differences so that we can easily visualize it. And that's what this technology is about, that how we can develop methods by adding these amino acid residues, or by, by modifying these amino acids. Um, so, just want to mention about these two technologies if you are not aware of what is that fluoro sequencing and nanopore sequencing. Um, basically, these two technologies uh, involve the extraction of the proteins from the cell and then you label proteins with variety of different groups and then use a particular detector. For fluoro sequencing, as the name indicates, you attach a fluorophore and look at the different colors, whereas for the nanopore sequencing, you look at the change in the current. So, what happens in this one? This is a protein, it goes through this membrane. As soon as it crosses this membrane, it we will see a change in the current. And that change in the current is dependent upon what group is present, uh, which, which amino acid residue is present. Now, um, the thing is if you look at this, this is a change in the current, but that change in the current is very less. And the reason is because different amino acid residues are very similar. So there is a change in the current, but that's not enough to actually accurately identify it. But if we could develop a method method by which we can label these amino acid residues and when they cross it then there would be a much bigger change, much bigger change, much bigger change in the current and then you can easily accurately identify this, the amino acids. And that's exactly what we are trying to do here to develop chemical methods for the different amino acid residues, different PTMs and we are focusing on the amino acid residues which are here in the blue region which are highly abundant in the proteome. So if we find a method for those amino acid residues, we can easily label them uh, as well as we can use these instruments either fluoro sequencing and nanopore sequencing to identify where they are and we can determine the entire sequence. Um, in fact, we, by using this method, we can cover greater than 99 percent of the proteome if we can just make label these 10 amino acid residues. We need not have to label the entire amino acid residue, just a most abundant amino acid residues. 
So uh, with that, I am going to uh, go over this briefly. Uh, but basically, this is all the fluoro sequencing technology platform. Uh, we label it with fluorophores, and then we chop one amino acid residue at the time, uh, record the change in the fluorescence, and that give us a signal. Whereas in the nanopore sequencing, this is how the currents look like. If you look at this current and this current, you cannot distinguish which amino acid is which because they are so similar to each other. But if you look at this one and this one, you can differentiate that. And that is because the difference between these two amino acid is very less, whereas difference between these two is very high. Um, and this is how a nanopore sequencer looks like. This is already commercially available in market where you put a sample here and let's say we have our probes. We put our probes along with the sample <coughs> and hook this up to the computer and with that we can actually sequence the entire proteome because currently it is utilized for sequencing the genome. The only thing which is missing is those tools which increases the molecular difference. So um, just want to show you this data uh, or a graph which tells us that these are the three amino acid residues which are very well known and their methods for targeting them. But if you look at all the amino acid residues in the red region, we do not have the methods to label them. Or we have a methods for labeling these blue amino acid residues, but those methods are cannot be used for sequencing because of the three reasons. One, either the probe or the product. They are not stable to any of these sequencing conditions. Secondly, they are not selective. When you try the reaction, rather than labeling only that amino acid residue, it starts labeling other groups as well. And the third is that it generates multiple products with one amino acid. So you can imagine in a protein, the same amino acid is, let's say, exists like 10,000 times. And each amino acid, if it's under forming five different products, then you're making the data so complicated that it's very difficult to analyze. So the goal of my project is or this chemical platform is basically develop these methods which are selective, uh, which are compatible as well as they generate only one product with the corresponding amino acid. And these are the rules we follow uh, which I have already mentioned they should be stable, work, work under aqueous conditions and should also be compatible with both the technologies fluoro sequencing and nanopore sequencing. Um, now I'm going to go on to very briefly about the methods. I know it is too much organic chemistry, but I just want to show uh, some of the basic science we are doing and what students are working on. And I will not spend much time on it, but I just want to tell you that we have developed these methods. But for example, this particular molecule only label these methionine residues in a highly selective manner. We also developed methods for asparagine and glutamine, and these are in the red region, means there is currently no methods out there by which you can label them and we are the ones who developed the first method to label them selectively by different fluorophores. Again, I'm not going into chemistries, um, but it's actually a dehydration reaction. Um, and then um, this is a method for arginine tagging. And you can see here, this complicated guanidinium group is now converting into this aldehyde group in a selective manner. And similarly, we are developing methods for other amino acid residues, um, which are in the red region. Um, and we will introduce only particular amino particular groups at these positions, as well as uh, amino acid residues like serine and threonine, we have two different strategies. So like I said, I'm not going into details, but I just want to show you that all these methods require a lot of um, basic science, think about organic chemistry, basic concepts, so that we can develop these uh, selective reactions. And we have filed a patent on all of these reactions, and that's why I really want to thank OTT um, uh, to, uh, to help us uh, achieve that goal. Um, and here I just want to quickly tell you that when we talk about post-translational modifications, now here we see these are different kind of post-translational modifications and what is going on from here to here, you will see that when this post-translational modification happened. When I say post-translational modification, we just assume that we have amino acid and it undergoes mo modification. Now in this modification, earlier that amino acid has positive charge, now it became neutral. And in this particular modification, earlier it was neutral and it becomes negative charge. Now these are big changes. Now if these changes happen, then we have the methods to look at it because you can easily detect because it's a bigger change. But problem happens when we have these kind of modifications like methylations on lysine and histidine, there is no change in the charge and in fact there is no change in the bulk because if you look at these modifications, it's this, we are adding 1CH3, 2CH3, 3CH3 and 1. So these are 
such small groups, they are not changing any charge, they are not changing any, uh, any physiochemical properties and they are the ones which give a same signal whether you have this modification or you do not have this modification. And that's why we need chemical methods for that. And this is, I just want to tell you that currently either mass spectrometry is used for that, but the mass difference between this modification and the difference in between the two, two amino acids is same. So you cannot actually identify whether you see this 14 mass difference because of the modification or it is just two different amino acids. Similarly, there are these antibodies, but these antibodies are known only for particular sequences. So if there is a mutation which leads to disease, we do not have antibodies for that. And in fact, these antibodies cannot differentiate 1 CH3 from 2 CH3 to 3 CH3 groups. So again, we need methods which are super selective only for one, for this, for this, and for this one. And again, you know, this is, I know more organic chemistry, but what we have done is we developed a method by which we can convert this N CH3 group to this aldehyde group and an aromatic group selectively without impacting any other amino acid residue. We also developed a method by which we can convert these two CS3 groups to this aldehyde group without impacting any other amino acid and PTM. And in the third method, we are working on actually developing two different strategies by converting these three CS3 groups to this alkene group or this thiocarbamate group. And one of my students worked on the method where she has converted this methylated group to this oxime moiety. So you can see there is a huge change and once there is a huge change and we can attach fluorophores, we can easily distinguish such a small change in the amino acid residues. So um, this is also uh, some data I want to show you that we have already tested our probes on a fluorosequencing which clearly shows that our method works really well in a fluorosequencing technology and by using this method we were able to identify the position of these post translational modifications on proteins um, because whenever you see a change in the signal, so for example here you see the fluorescence, here there is no fluorescence that tells us that the position is number 2 because after second position we stop seeing the fluorescence. And that is a place where the modification was made. Um, so it works really well and we are collaborating with companies like Arision, which is a startup company based on a fluorosequencing technology as well as the founders of the fluorosequencing technology. So overall, uh, what we have done in this technology is that we are building these chemical platform. We have already built several chemical tools, but we are expanding those chemical tools more so that we can identify the entire sequence of the proteome and develop a transformative technology as a genome sequencing. We should have another technology which is proteome sequencing because currently we have nothing out there. By using our methods, we can increase the high throughput. We can actually sequence billions of peptides uh, in one in a parallel, uh, we can get accurate identification and accurate quantification also because all these labels we are attaching increases the differences between amino acids and post translation modifications and we can also discover new protein biomarkers. Now this is one of the um, reason why we started building this in this chemical platform but it has other advantages too and I am going to uh, talk about that and just for another 5 minutes which is that we can actually expand the druggable content of the protein. So what do I mean by that? Now um, druggable content of the protein means that so many companies you know are involved in drug discovery. You name any company they are involved in drug discovery. There are so many groups who are involved in drug discovery. What are we developing drugs for? We are developing drugs for these 15% of the proteins. Because for the rest 85% of the proteins, we have no idea how to drug them. And that's why they are called as undruggable because we have no idea what the active sites of those proteins look like. If we don't know that, we don't know their structures, how we will design the inhibitor. So that's the problem that everyone in the world is just chasing these 15% and, and we are not looking at what happens to those 85% of the proteins and maybe those are the ones which are responsible for diseases and we need to find cure for those proteins, abnormal proteins. So, one of the method which is called as activity based protein profiling has been used for identifying the active sites and this is actually based on the concept that amino acid residues which are present in the active site are more reactive. So if I use a less amount of a reagent, only those amino acid residues which are present in the active site will react and that will indirectly give me the information Then this entire protein, this is a site which is targetable because this is the active site of the protein and if we block that, we can block the function of the protein. 
and yes this technique have been used but again it can target only 15 percent of the proteome because it's focused only on these three amino acid residues which i have mentioned earlier so now with these amino acid residues tagging which we have developed the the methods for now we can expand this druggable content of the proteome because we can use these methods to label these amino acid residues by using activity based protein profiling and then we can figure out the proteins which have the active sites and once we figure out the active sites we can eventually develop the inhibitors for that. So we are actually expanding the druggable content of the proteome from 15 percent to the next level. Uh, and uh, for this one we are collaborating with Novartis um, as well as Dan Numura at UC Berkeley for carrying out these activity based protein profiling studies by using our probes. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to just skip this data, but basically what we want, what I want to show you here that we actually used our probes for activity based protein profiling and we clearly see that if we use a less amount of this probe, we see less labeling of the proteins. It means these proteins have the active sites which contain this methionine amino acid residue and we have actually identified unique proteins which have active sites which are methionine. So now this probe can itself act as an inhibitor for those particular proteins and we are expanding more in this direction. But this is just one set of the data and we have more data for different amino acid residues. So overall, uh, what my uh, this technology platform is doing, um, of course, we are developing a single molecule protein sequencing technology, but it's also expanding the druggable content of the proteome from 15% to we believe that we can expand it to greater than 75% by using our probes. Secondly, it will be able to identify dark proteome. And if you are not aware of what dark proteome is, it's very strange. There are proteins in our body and we have no idea what those are. And that's what is called dark proteome. But there is a very strong evidence genetically and by transcriptomically that those proteins do exist but we don't know and that's why we gave them a name dark proteome. But by, and the reason is again, you know, you can differentiate it, they're less abundant, they all are similar, but if we use our methods and add a tag on them, we can actually identify them. So that's the another advantage of this technology that we can discover dark proteome and any molecules we are generating in this, we can use them as a drug molecules for targeting various protein, protein interactions or abnormal proteins. So, just I want to summarize regarding this technology that these tools which we are developing could be as transformative for proteomics research as the next generation sequencing is for genomics research. And with that, um, I will just stop here and I'm re I really want to thank all of you for listening and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have a microphone and we can capture questions. Sure. Wonderful talk. Thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, I have so many questions. Of course. Very exciting I'll be happy to answer. Um, so just a few with, um, you were showing your proteins in the folded state. Mm -hmm. So are you just labeling the outsides of your proteins? And then kind of as a follow up to that, um, are these labels compatible? So would you do one and then another, then another? Or would you do one and then multiple reads? Um, that's a, both of the questions are amazing and I'll uh, start with the first question which is that I showed that the protein is folded but there are two different technologies one is fluoro sequencing in fluoro sequencing we actually take the whole protein uh, proteome chop it up into smaller fragments then we put that proteome onto a microscopic slide like we immobilize it once we immobilize it then we add fluorophores or methods and then in that case the idea is you add one fluorophore wash it off add another fluorophore, wash it off. And in this way, we can actually look at different amino acid residues at the same time. But I would also like to tell you that we are not putting all the labels at the same time. Because ideally, if we can identify four amino acid residues in a row, we can identify which protein is that based on the, by putting that information in the reference database. So the idea, the, what we are currently doing is take one protein, chop it up into smaller fragments, immobilize it, and then divide it into different sections. Four labels for one section, four different labels for another section, four different labels for another section. And then all the data we get from those different labels, we can put them together and exactly or accurately identify which protein is that. 
So that is for fluoro sequencing. For nanopore sequencing, we don't chop it up, but yes, we denature it. And the reason is that if we don't denature it, then the problem is that all the amino acid residues which are inside um, because of the structure, they might not get labeled properly. And for sequencing process, we want to see the sequence rather than the function at that time. So even if it loses its function because of the opening up, it's fine because we want to determine the sequence. And in that case, we once we open it up, label it, same thing, four labels at the time is enough to actually identify it. And then there are another four labels and another four labels and combine that data. Does, does it answer your question? Yeah, so I think that was your first question. And your second question was, um, um, what was your second question? I think that took both of them. It was kind of the outside of the protein versus the whole sequence. Okay. And then multiple layers. Of yes. Things. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. Cool. Thank you for a wildly impressive talk. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm familiar with protein expression in the brain, which is quite plastic in response to a variety of environmental factors as well as the internal state of an animal. If you were to take a sample from a human and look at their proteome today, and then you take another sample from them a week from now, would it look similar? Uh, or basically I'm asking how flexible is the proteome, and is the idea with disease and cancer states that protein expression profiles are relatively stable? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me tell you. Uh, so, it, in the disease states, yes, the protein profile will change, but it doesn't change dramatically. So, for example, let's say um, uh, the disease state happened because of the mutation. Now, mutation does not mean that all the amino acids will be mutated or the sequence of the proteins will change. The sequence will still remain the same. Maybe one amino acid changed to some other amino acid, or one amino acid gets the modification which was not originally present in the normal disease state and in the, and that's the reason that when we are comparing the two we take the proteome of the healthy um, control you can say and another one is a diseased and then you can actually compare the two that this and that actually leads to discovery of protein biomarkers because now you can say that this protein or this kind of sequence is present only in the disease samples and not in the healthy samples it means that if we just look at that sequence in future we can actually use that as a biomarker and if any one is have that sequence maybe they are carrying a disease but they are not at the stage where we can analyze it by like CT scan or MRI but we can analyze them at much earlier stage because now we know that sequence is responsible for disease because usually what happens is that um, you when we use CT, CT scan or MRI and all that they are looking at the lumps right and that lumps does not form automatically it takes time and that time consumption happens and we can't we don't know till we see that lump that someone is carrying a disease but if we can identify it at more molecular level that if the concentration of these proteins are increasing and that is responsible for creating a lump we can actually control it or maybe detect it at much earlier level which is much easy to cure than the late stage cancer last follow up to that so um, will the proteome profile look very different depending on which tissue you're Yes, that will be different and that's the thing, right? Usually we get, when we talk about the reference database, we have different proteome for different tissues and then we compare it with the healthy one we have and then we look at the diseased ones. Yes. So I dare to ask a question as a non-chemicist uh, person and that is you presented four different techniques or four different projects that you work on. And my question to you is, did they uh, evolve from one to the next, or uh, are these very independent, so to speak, developed? Uh, in other words, did they organically emerge from one to the next stage, mm -hmm. the way you present them, go from one to two? Mm -hmm. Or uh, how did they come about, and how do they interact, or how are they interdependent? So um, let me uh, answer the first question that how do these projects emerged. Um, so some of them emerged while working on the another one. So for example, like the one which I just mentioned, which is protein sequencing technology. So you can say that now we are looking at the druggable content of the proteome. That's a, you know, organic. 
uh, way of emerging of a new project from the same project. But if we talk about the um, cyclic peptides project versus the protein sequencing project, they are completely different from each other because one is more about diagnostic tool and one is more about developing therapeutics. So they are uh, discovered or maybe I would say they were thought separately. Um, but uh, uh, whether they are interdependent on each other or not, um, the answer is yes, because if you think about it, every the whole the, the whole theme, if you look at it, it somehow relates to proteomes, right? Whether it's proteome targeting, whether it is proteome analysis, whether it is whether it is figuring out technology to cure the diseases by making inhibitor or by using a different approach of a, like protein restoration technology. So yeah, the overall theme is about proteome. Uh, but I would say also that the, um, the project about protein restoration technology that kind of emerged or I would say organically emerged from therapeutics one because um, you know I was working on these technology for making therapeutics and then I was like everyone in the world is doing this right and it's a good way and of course we have um, made a significant progress but what about uh, thinking out of the box and think about that maybe there are other ways by which you can solve this problem because of course inhibitors are not solving all the problems um, and that way I started thinking about why can't we just restore the functions of the protein. Now the question is how can we do that? Then you know then you read more about it and, and so this they are a little bit interdependent um, and some of them originate from each other. Thank you so much. Sorry? It is very different than Emerson presentation. Yes. <laughs> And it's actually, it's, uh, your research is going to be the really got promoted from AI initiatives, which I think they have. I'm wondering just how you see those resources could help you, how you can actually ut utilize that initiative for your Oh, actually there are several ways we can utilize AI initiative. In fact, I have not mentioned some of the things. For example, the one which I briefly mentioned about the sensors, that if we have the data, we need AI to analyze it. And we need AI to actually provide the information that if we are getting a new data, they can spit out what it would be. So I think their AI would be very, very useful. Besides that, if we think about that project was about the second technology, which is diagnostic tool. But for the therapeutic one where I discussed about about these millions of cyclic peptides we can synthesize. Now, the thing is that there is no way you can figure out whether these compounds will target intracellular proteins or not because we don't know whether they will permeate the cell. But by using this method and we are generating experimental data, if we feed that information to AI, then eventually they, we can get an algorithm by which we can identify before we even start making it, that whether it is even worth making these compounds because if they are not going to cross the cellular membrane, what's the point even if they are good binders? So that would actually um, completely change how we design the molecules and how we are looking at um, developing therapeutics. So yes, I think it would be a huge huge benefit. In fact, we uh, collaborated with Merck to use their AI platform so that we are generating a data, they will use their AI platform and then we can eventually figure out uh, which, which compounds, what kind of characteristics are needed for make a compound cell permeable without losing its shape. So yes, um, it, it would greatly benefit um, if we have that, um, you know, more established here. So you just mentioned Merck, and in some of your slides you talked a little bit about uh, the Office of Technology, which helps you to uh, take the discoveries you have in basic science and translate that or begin to think about how you translate that into actually apply drugs. And as someone who doesn't work in that area, I have no clue what that process looks like. So how do we go from basic science to therapies that actually change people's lives? What does that look like? Um, so uh, two things, one is that um, we kind of know like what our bigger goal is, we knew that why we are making these compounds so that we can reach to some translational research where technologies which could help or benefit human health. But in terms of uh, how Office of Tra uh, Tech uh, Transfer is helping us because if we don't uh, patent those molecules which are basic 
methodologies, then we won't be able to commercialize it in future. So that's the reason that how OTT is helping us that if there is any new method we are developing, we talk to them and explain that how this could have a potentially a much longer or uh, health or I would say impact to human health. And that helps them um, uh, figuring out that this is a very good tech, uh, chemical method, although it is currently at the basic research level, but it has a huge potential. And then they do their market survey and they figure out that yes, there is nothing like this there and where, at how many areas it can be useful. And based on that, they decide whether they want to file a patent on this. Does, it, does that answer yeah, your question? But then once a patent is filed, how does it actually get developed into a product that you can buy in the store? So that's, is that a partnership where you directly work with Merck or some other company or is that something where they are buying the technology and they figure out how to apply it? So there are two things we are doing and actually I'm also a part of this, this um, uh, founder firm, uh, uh, entrepreneur firm where what we are trying to do is that, for example, I want to open some companies related to my technology. Now there are two ways to do it. One is you sell, license your technology because there are patents already out there. So you uh, you license your technology to let's say Novartis, to Merck or Arisian, um, and then let them do what they want to do with your chemical probes. Um, and then the another thing is that you can actually always do the non-exclusive um, um, non license. So even if they are trying to use that technology in their product, you can still do something else with it. You're not limited that they have to do everything. Everything. So that's one way to do it. The another one is that why don't you open your startup company and start developing this product more, show more utility of that so that eventually your company can grow and then um, you know it's up to you if you want to develop it more and take it to the next level or you you know and then you know you talk to venture capitalists find out the who will be the C CEO of the company because as a academic researcher I am not trained um, in that business part of it so that's what you do or you will um, um, you know if your company grow really big then you can actually sell it to some bigger company if they are interested in that or you can still continue to grow if you think that but your vision is not matching with the vision of the other company. So I think these are the two ways and I would say um, the easy way is license it but the drawback of that is that they do not have the same vision as you have. So I, I think the other path is more um, you can actually take your company and, and do the things with it which you want to do uh, which maybe another company will not do. So. I have a question. I have a second question. Sure. Um, which is, um, you're talking about basic science having a huge impact on the lives of millions of people, potentially. Can you talk a little bit about your impact on the lives of the students in your lab? Mm -hmm. and what that's like? You were incredibly proud the way you introduced them. Sure. And so, uh, what is it like to incorporate undergraduates into your lab? What skills do they have? And how do you translate that into changing their life trajectory and such? So I think for undergraduates, um, I am not, whenever I hire undergraduates, I'm not looking for whether they should have any skill. Because they are undergraduates, I, it's too much to expect that they would be trained in every technique and then hire them. Otherwise, they won't be undergraduates, right? So that's what I'm not looking for. I hire people only based on two things. First, um, are they willing to learn new things? Secondly, are they passionate about this research? If they have these two things, they are welcome to join my group. And then how we develop that? Um, so once they join our group, uh, I usually put them with some grad students or postdocs which, who train them in all these different kind of techniques we are working on, going from organic senses to peptide senses to proteins to cell studies. Now once they are trained in all those techniques, then they are they can work independently. Um, they can actually um, you know work on completely new project and they, they if they don't want to work with graduate students and postdoc and think about new ideas, they can do in that direction. Or if they want to just help graduate students and un, or postdocs develop their project, they can do that. And I think I would like to give you an example of uh, some students which I have listed in my slide, um, uh, Daniel Wang and Patrick, uh, they both are undergraduates in my lab and they are actually uh, graduating uh, this year, which I'm really sad because they're going to leave. But both of them, one of them actually uh, is a first author in one of my paper, which is uh, submitted to Nature Communication. We already got the revisions and we have submitted it. And I think anytime soon, we will get that paper out. No grad students, no postdoc. 
all that project is led by him, both the undergrads, um, Daniel and Patrick. And the another thing, when they learn these things, they get passionate about it. So you won't believe that the student, uh, I have Patrick, he, he's actually going for MD, PhD. He already got into multiple schools, but he requested to stay in summer this year also and he stayed all the summers in my lab and worked but this summer also because I told him that before you start your medical school you should just enjoy you know take some time off and he's like no I'm so much passionate about this work that I want to finish it before I take off so he's actually continuing in the lab so I think that's what I would say I think I, for me I think this is a big impact I'm making in their lives that I'm making them um, you know passionate about the work they do and they are so much interested that Although they have such long paths to go, they still want to come in summer and work. So um, yeah, and I'm really, really proud of them. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank yes. you so much. We have a question now, so we have to be careful with the time because you need to be somewhere. Yeah, yeah. That, that's so, fine. Yeah. Any other questions? Any. Okay. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you this so much. This was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here.